This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Essays of Francis Bacon. Essay 57 of Anger. To seek to extinguish anger utterly is but a bravery of the Stoics. We have better oracles. Be angry, but sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your anger. Anger must be limited and confined, both in race and in time. We will first speak how the natural inclination and habit to be angry may be attempted and calmed. Secondly, how the particular motions of anger may be repressed, or at least refrained from doing mischief. Thirdly, how to raise anger or appease anger in another. For the first, there is no other way but to meditate and ruminate well upon the effects of anger, how it troubles man's life. And the best time to do this is to look back upon anger when the fit is thoroughly over. Seneca saith well, that anger is like ruin, which breaks itself upon that it falls. The scripture exhorteth us to possess our souls in patience. Whosoever is out of patience is out of possession of his soul. Men must not turn bees. Animesque in vulnere panunt. Anger is certainly a kind of baseness, as it appears well in the weakness of those subjects in whom it reigns. Children, women, old folks, sick folks. Only men must beware that they carry their anger rather with scorn than with fear, so that they may seem rather to be above the injury than below it, which is a thing easily done if a man will give law to himself in it. For the second point, the causes and motives of anger are chiefly three. First, to be too sensible of hurt, for no man is angry that feels not himself hurt and therefore tender and delicate persons must needs be oft angry. They have so many things to trouble them, which more robust natures have little sense of. The next is the apprehension and construction of the injury offered, to be, in the circumstances thereof, full of contempt. For contempt is that which putteth an edge upon anger, as much or more than the hurt itself. Therefore, when men are ingenious in picking out circumstances of contempt, they do kindle their anger much. Lastly, opinion of the touch of a man's reputation doth multiply and sharpen anger, wherein the remedy is that a man should have, as Consalvo was wont to say, telum honoris cressiorum. But in all refrainings of anger, it is the best remedy to win time, and to make a man's self believe that the opportunity of his revenge is not yet come, but that he foresees a time for it, and so to still himself in the meantime and reserve it. To contain anger from mischief, though it take hold of a man, there be two things whereof you must have special caution, the one of extreme bitterness of words especially if they be aculeate and proper, for communia maledicta are nothing so much, and again, that in anger a man reveal no secrets, for that makes him not fit for society. The other, that you do not peremptorily break off in any business in a fit of anger, but howsoever you show bitterness, do not act anything that is not revocable. For raising and appeasing anger in another, it is done chiefly by choosing of times, when men are frowardest and worst disposed to incense them. Again, by gathering, as was touched before, all that you can find out to aggravate the contempt. And the two remedies are by the contraries, the former to take good times when first to relate to a man an angry business, for the first impression is much, and the other is to sever, as much as may be, the construction of the injury from the point of contempt, imputing it to misunderstanding, 
fear, passion, or what you will. Essay 58 Of Vicissitude of Things Solomon saith, There is no new thing upon the earth, so that as Plato had an imagination that all knowledge was but remembrance, so Solomon giveth his sentence that all novelty is but oblivion, whereby you may see that the river of Lethe runneth as well above ground as below. There is an abstruse astrologer that saith, If it were not for two things that are constant, the one is that the fixed stars ever stand a like distance one from another, and never come nearer together, nor go further asunder, the other that the diurnal motion perpetually keepeth time. No individual would last one moment. Certain it is that the matter is in a perpetual flux, and never at a stay. The great winding sheets that bury all things in oblivion are two, deluges and earthquakes. As for conflagrations and great droughts, they do not merely dispeople and destroy. Phaeton's car went but a day, and the three years' drought in the time of Elias was but particular, and left people alive. As for the great burnings by lightnings, which are often in the West Indies, they are but narrow. But in the other two destructions, by deluge and earthquake, it is further to be noted that the remnant of people which have to be reserved are commonly ignorant and mountainous people that can give no account of the time past, so that the oblivion is all one, as if none had been left. If you consider well of the people of the West Indies, it is very probable that they are a newer or a younger people than the people of the old world, and it is much more likely that the destruction that hath heretofore been there was not by earthquakes, as the Egyptian priest told Ceylon concerning the island of Atlantis, that it was swallowed by an earthquake, but rather that it was desolated by a particular deluge. For earthquakes are seldom in those parts, but on the other side they have such pouring rivers as the rivers of Asia and Africa and Europe are but brooks to them. Their Andes, likewise, or mountains, are far higher than those with us, whereby it seems that the remnants of generation of men were in such a particular deluge saved. As for the observation that Machiavel hath, that the jealousy of sex doth much extinguish the memory of things, traducing Gregory the Great, that he did what in him lay to extinguish all heathen antiquities, I do not find that those zeals do any great effects, nor last long, as it appeared in the succession of Sabinian, who did revive the former antiquities. The vicissitude of mutations in the superior globe are no fit matter for this present argument. It may be Plato's great year, if the world should last so long, would have some effect, not in renewing the state of like individuals, for that is the fume of those that conceive the celestial bodies have more accurate influences upon these things below than indeed they have, but in gross. Comets, out of question, have likewise power and effect over the gross and mass of things, but they are rather gazed upon and waited upon in their journey than wisely observed in their effects, especially in their respective effects, that is, what kind of comet for magnitude, color, version of the beams, placing in the reign of heaven, or lasting, produceth what kind of effects. There is a toy which I have heard, and I would not have it given over, but waited upon a little. They say it is observed in the low countries, I know not in what part, that every five and thirty years the same kind and suit of years and weathers come about again, as great frost, great wet, great droughts, warm winters, summers with little heat, and the like, and they call it the prime. It is a thing I do the rather mention because, computing backwards, I have found some concurrence. But to leave these points of nature and to come to men, the greatest vicissitude of things amongst men is the vicissitude of sects and religions, for those orbs rule in men's minds most. 
the true religion is built upon the rock the rest are tossed upon the waves of time to speak therefore of the causes of new sects and to give some counsel concerning them as far as the weakness of human judgment can give stay to so great revolutions when the religion formerly received is rent by discords and when the holiness of the professors of religion is decayed and full of scandal and withal the times be stupid ignorant and barbarous you may doubt the springing up of a new sect if then also there should arise any extravagant and strange spirit to make himself author thereof all which points held when mahomet published his law if a new sect have not two properties fear it not for it will not spread the one is the supplanting or the opposing of authority established for nothing is more popular than that the other is the giving license to pleasures and a voluptuous life for as for speculative heresies such as were in ancient times the arians and now the armenians though they work mightily upon men's wits yet they do not produce any great alterations in states except it be by the help of civil occasions there be three manner of plantations of new sects by the power of signs and miracles by the eloquence and wisdom of speech and persuasion and by the sword for martyrdoms i reckon them amongst miracles because they seem to exceed the strength of human nature and i may do the like of superlative and admirable holiness of life surely there is no better way to stop the rising of new sects and schisms than to reform abuses to compound the smaller differences to proceed mildly and not with sanguinary persecutions and rather to take off the principal authors by winning and advancing them than to enrage them by violence and bitterness the changes and vicissitude in wars are many but chiefly in three things in the seats or stages of war in the weapons and in the manner of the conduct wars in ancient time seemed more to move from east to west for the persians assyrians arabians tartars which were the invaders were all eastern people it is true the gauls were western but we read but of two incursions of theirs the one to gallo grecia the other to rome but east and west have no certain points of heaven and no more have the wars either from the east or west any certainty of observation but north and south are fixed and it hath seldom or never been seen that the far southern people have invaded the northern but contrariwise whereby it is manifest that the northern tract of the world is in nature the more martial region be it in respect of the stars of that hemisphere or of the great continents that are upon the north whereas the south part for aught that is known is almost all sea or which is most apparent of the cold of the northern parts which is that which without aid of discipline doth make the bodies hardest and the courages warmest upon the breaking and shivering of a great state and empire you may be sure to have wars for great empires while they stand do enervate and destroy the forces of the natives which they have subdued resting upon their own protecting forces and then when they fail also all goes to ruin and they become a prey so it was in the decay of the roman empire and likewise in the empire of almain after charles the great every bird taking a feather and were not unlike to befall spain if it should break the great accessions and unions of kingdoms do likewise stir up wars for when a state grows to an overpower it is like a great flood that will be sure to overflow as it hath been seen in the states of rome turkey spain and others look when the world hath fewest barbarous peoples but such as commonly will not marry or generate except they know means to live as it is almost everywhere at this day except tartary there is no danger of inundations of people 
but when there be great shoals of people which go on to populate without foreseeing means of life and sustenation it is of necessity that once in an age or two they discharge a portion of their people upon other nations which the ancient northern people were wont to do by lot casting lots what part should stay at home and what should seek their fortunes when a warlike state grows soft and effeminate they may be sure of a war for commonly such states are grown rich in the time of their degenerating and so the prey inviteth and their decay in valor encourageth a war as for the weapons it hardly falleth under rule and observation yet we see even they have returns and vicissitudes for certain it is that ordinance was known in the city of the oxidrakes in india and was that which the macedonians called thunder and lightning and magic and it is well known that the use of ordnance hath been in china above two thousand years the conditions of weapons and their improvement are first the fetching afar off for that outruns the danger as it is seen in ordnance and muskets secondly the strength of the percussion wherein likewise ordnance do exceed all Arietations and ancient inventions. The third is the commodious use of them, as that they may serve in all weathers, that the carriage may be light and manageable, and the like. For the conduct of the war, at the first men rested extremely upon number. They did put the wars likewise upon main force and valor pointing days for pitched fields and so trying it out upon an even match and they were more ignorant in ranging and arraying their battles after they grew to rest upon number rather competent than vast they grew to advantage of place cunning diversions and the like and they grew more skilful in the ordering of their battles in the youth of a state arms do flourish in the middle age of a state learning and then both of them together for a time in the declining age of a state mechanical arts and merchandise learning hath his infancy when it is but beginning and almost childish then his youth when it is luxuriant and juvenile then his strength of years when it is solid and reduced and lastly his old age when it waxeth dry and exhaust but it is not good to look too long upon these turning wheels of vicissitude lest we become giddy as for the philology of them that is but a circle of tales and therefore not fit for this writing essay fifty nine of fame the poets make fame a monster they describe her in part finely and elegantly and in part gravely and sententiously they say look how many feathers she hath so many eyes she hath underneath so many tongues so many voices she pricks up so many ears this is a flourish there follow excellent parables as that she gathereth strength in going that she goeth upon the ground and yet hideth her head in the clouds that in the daytime she sitteth in a watch-tower and flieth most by night that she mingleth things done with things not done and that she is a terror to great cities but that which passeth all the rest is they do recount that the earth mother of the giants that made war against jupiter and were destroyed by him thereupon in an anger brought forth fame for certain it is that rebels figured by the giants and seditious fames and libels are but brothers and sisters masculine and feminine but now if a man can tame this monster and bring her to feed at the hand and govern her and with her fly other ravening fowl and kill them it is somewhat worth but we are infected with the style of the poets to speak now in a sad and serious manner there is not in all the politics a place less handled and more worthy to be handled than this of fame we will therefore speak of these points 
what are false fames and what are true fames, and how they may be best discerned, how fames may be sown and raised, how they may be spread and multiplied, and how they may be checked and laid dead, and other things concerning the nature of fame. Fame is of that force, as there is scarcely any great action, wherein it hath not a great part, especially in the war. Mucianus undid Vitellius by a fame that he scattered that Vitellius had in purpose to remove the legions of Syria into Germany, and the legions of Germany into Syria, whereupon the legions of Syria were infinitely inflamed. Julius Caesar took Pompey unprovided, and laid asleep his industry and preparations, by a fame that he cunningly gave out. Caesar's own soldiers loved him not, and being wearied with the wars, and laden with the spoils of Gaul, would forsake him as soon as he came into Italy. Livia settled all things for the succession of her son Tiberius, by continual giving out that her husband Augustus was upon recovery and amendment, and it is an unusual thing with the Pashas to conceal the death of the great Turk from the Janizaries and men of war, to save the sacking of Constantinople and other towns as their manner is. Themistocles made Xerxes, king of Persia, post a pace out of Greece, by giving out that the Grecians had a purpose to break his bridge of ships which he had made a thwart Hellespont. There be a thousand such like examples, and the more they are, the less they need to be repeated, because a man meeteth with them everywhere. Therefore let all wise governors have as great a watch and care over fames as they have of the actions and designs themselves. This essay was not finished. End of The Essays of Francis Bacon Recorded for LibriVox.org